you've got a spare 15 seconds, then I'll just leave it at this. Benjamin Sisko is the best captain in the entire history of Star Trek. That is it. Thank you for stopping by. If you've got a bit longer, though, let's have a little chat. Benjamin Lafayette Sisko, born in New Orleans in 2332, the only son of Sarah and Joseph Sisko, would go on to be, arguably, the most important cultural and political figure in the entire Alpha Quadrant. After a tumultuous career that saw him lose his wife and his ship at the Battle of Wolf 359, he overcame some serious misgivings about Starfleet to become its most seminal figurehead. There are many qualities that make a great captain, though, and indeed the debates rage over whether he or Picard or Kirk or Janeway or even Archer best represent what it means to sit in the big chair. While there are strong cases for all of them, when fully examined as both a commanding officer and a human being, it's Sisko that undoubtedly emerges above them all. As a father, as a husband, as a friend, as a soldier, and even as the emissary, he is undisputed, but let's take a look at why he's Star Trek's greatest captain as well. Number 10, he's human. Before we get into the many heroic endeavours or nuanced character beats that make Benjamin Sisko Starfleet's finest commanding officer, let's take a quick look at the background of the man, as it's that, more than anything seen on the show itself, that sets him apart from his many peers. James Kirk was a prodigy who achieved the rank of captain quicker than anyone in the history of Starfleet. Jean-Luc Picard came from the supreme stock of Nobel Prize winners and explorers, and Catherine Janeway was the daughter of a Starfleet admiral. In contrast to that, Benjamin Sisko arrived on Deep Space Nine, the son of a chef, feeling at odds with Starfleet's objectives, a single father, and a still grieving widow. He carries trauma, he carries pain, he makes mistakes, he has regrets, he loses his cool, he is stubborn, he is, by the standards of a Starfleet CO, astonishingly imperfect, and as a result, endearingly human. Number 9. He's Starfleet. What it means to be a Starfleet officer could easily be a list entirely of its own, but from what we've seen of the hundreds of men and women to wear that uniform on the show, you need to be consumed by this idea of furthering galactic progress through both interstellar exploration and scientific discovery, to explore strange new worlds and to seek out very clever ways of doing so. Benjamin Sisko is not an explorer in the classic sense. His Starfleet career has very rarely seen him pioneering exploration in the same way we've seen Messrs. Kirk, Archer, Picard and Janeway do it. But he has has helped expand the Federation's horizons in ways they never could. As well as opening up the Gamma Quadrant and all the new challenges that brought about, he also united a fractured Bajoran society, made his station a thriving hub of interspecies cooperation, and even built relationships with the non-corporeal entities residing in the wormhole. All that and the man himself is at heart a builder. He makes things. From growing up in his father's restaurant to joining Starfleet as an engineer, his powers of creation dwarf those of his fellow captains. Captains. Number 8, but he's not to Starfleet. Benjamin Sisko the Builder is a very easy to like character who exemplifies all of the idealised versions of Starfleet. They discover new technologies, they make peace with new races, they push humanity into new and exciting areas of the galaxy, and above all else, they're the good guys. But space, and indeed life itself, is not as simple as that. Governing yourself and your empire with a series of stringent codes designed to support the greater good sounds like a lovely future for humanity, but it leaves them tone deaf to the harsh realities faced by a lot of their further flung endeavours. Sisko at times presents the idealised version of a Starfleet captain, but he himself is a realist. In the Pale Moonlight is easily the best character study in Star Trek history and details his plan to alter the course of the war by allying with a former Cardassian spy to con a Romulan senator. When his plan's exposed, Garrick has the subject and his own accomplice killed in order to pull off the deception and cover their tracks, all while Sisko realises that, in the end, he's fine with that. Picard is famously quoted as saying, the first duty of every Starfleet officer is to the truth, but in Sisko's own words here, he lied, he cheated, he bribed men to cover the crimes of other men, and he is an accessory to murder, but he can live with that because the Federation needs him to. Number 7, being a captain doesn't define him. Jean-Luc Picard likes archaeology, Catherine Janeway likes coffee, Jonathan Archer likes his dog, and James Kirk was just an incredible intergalactic shagger. That is, by and large, all you really know about these four people because their major defining character trait is that they were the captain of a Federation starship. That's no slight against them, of course, it was literally their job, but that job was their entire life. But let's just quickly count up all the things that were Benjamin Sisko's entire life. He was an engineer who loved to build things. He's a restaurant quality chef who can make soul food so good your head will spin. He held down a loving 
rebuilding marriage, which unlike everybody else, he managed to balance with his career. He single-handedly raised a son on the frontiers of Starfleet exploration. He's really into baseball. He was the captain of the Academy wrestling team. He became an ambassador to a fractured alien society, successfully navigated the Federation through an interstellar war, and was selected by a series of godlike creatures to be their representative in our universe. Benjamin Sisko was a Starfleet captain, yes, but he was still Benjamin Sisko first. Number six, he had absolutely zero time for your bullshit. Very much in the same vein of Sisko never being too Starfleet, that dedication to reason and duty that defined both Janeway and Picard always came secondary to his emotional drive. In short, he would act decisively without agonizing too much about whether or not it was the right thing to do, or to put that in more Star Trek terms, there are no scenes of him staring pensively out of a window. Where Picard would have become embroiled in some war of words with Q, Sisko just punched him in the face and was never bothered by him again. Where Janeway attempted to integrate the Marquis into her own crew so they could all do things the Starfleet way, Sisko poisoned their planets to have one of their leaders surrender to him. Where literally any normal person would have just kept their head down after falling back in time to a series of culturally vital civil rights riots, or told the crazed hallucinating Cardassian with a gun he wasn't actually responsible for all that genocide, Sisko reached deep into his pockets and pulled out his own middle finger with the words, this is how it is, son, tattooed up the middle. I mean, the man once told Quark if he caught him so much as littering on the promenade, he would personally nail him to a wall, so... Number five, he's bald by choice. Yeah, look, right, I'm a huge fan of Picard, but there is no dignity in this trim, is there? Number four, he's a leader in war. While a lot of captains will tell you that they went to war during their time on the show, none of them were ever on the front lines of an actual war. The difference is that while you might consider yourself embroiled in a conflict with a particular race, you don't get two or three episodes pissing around in the holodeck between armed engagements. No captain in Star Trek history has gone to war in the way Ben Sisko did. From being the man at the very forefront of the Federation's first encounters with the Dominion, to personally leading the joint Starfleet, Klingon and Romulan task force that assaulted Cardassia, Sisko was a wartime captain not seen in the franchise either before or since. There's a lot more to it than simply being in a lot of combat situations though, and his camaraderie with his crew, even in the face of unconscionable losses and the war slowly being lost, was incredible. Personally toasting every depleted phaser coil showed that he understood what made those under him tick and dedicated his own energy to keeping them going. Whether it was on the bridge of a ship or, as was literally the case in a number of episodes, in the trenches themselves, Sisko always led from the front. Number three, Andy was an icon of peace. It's all well and good being handy with a phaser, but Starfleet's primary mission is one of peace. Granted, it's not always that simple, but when it is, then a captain's primary responsibility is in bridging the political and cultural gaps between civilizations. Nobody had a harder task in this regard than Benjamin Sisko. Brought in to help facilitate Bejor's entry into the Federation, Sisko found himself constantly caught between the military maneuverings of their former Cardassian overlords, the often naive wishes of the Federation, and the social divisions erupting between the Bajorans themselves. There was no escaping any of these, and week after week, a new challenge presented itself. But by being installed as the emissary to the Prophets and discovering the wormhole, he simultaneously united a fractured society and created a strategic position resilient to the politics that threatened to overwhelm it. Even when relationships with the Klingons dissolved into open war, he constantly lobbied for peace, finding the restraint and the composure to implore Gowron in the middle of a blood-soaked battle with Starfleet's foot on the Klingons' throats to call off his forces. I mean, if that had been me, I am absolutely winning that battle and never letting the Klingons forget it, but that's why I'm not Benjamin Sisko. Number two, his character arc is incredible. Don't get me wrong, if you're the main protagonist of a show that runs for seven years and produces 176 episodes and you don't have some sort of dramatic character arc, then something has gone terribly wrong. But it's the sheer magnitude of Benjamin Sisko's personal journey that's unrivaled in Star Trek. Initially, we are presented with a broken man being appointed to a broken situation. After losing his wife at the Battle of Wolf 359, he tried to raise Jake on his own while holding down a position at the Utopia Planitia shipyards. Being then sent out to the furthest reaches of space to help resolve some volatile political 
situation was enough to bring him to the verge of resigning his commission. The emotive and entirely human voyage he embarks upon, though, sees him emerging as an inspiring figurehead for both Starfleet's military endeavours and the spiritual development of Bajor itself. He forms unbreakable bonds with his crew and his political peers, he learns to love all over again with Cassidy Yates, and in the show's final episode, transcends the mortal plane to live in the Celestial Temple. As personal arcs go, starting as a permanently furious man with 400 axes to grind and ending it as a godlike being who speaks only in riddles is some flex. Number one, Jake Sisko. Without question, the one defining element of Benjamin Sisko's character that makes him unarguably the best captain in Star Trek history is Jake Sisko. Avery Brooks himself credits the relationship that he developed with Lofton as one of the things he is most proud of in his career. He has spoken time and again about the need to show a present father, particularly one of colour, in the life of a young man, as so often they are depicted as absent. Sisko is the only Star Trek captain whose family life is presented as being as important as his professional life and his dedication to his young son is often profoundly moving. While this relationship gave us the basis for a number of Deep Space Nine's best episodes, The Visitor in particular one of the show's most heartbreaking, the way it informed Sisko's character was arguably more important, if not always as apparent. Every decision, every action, every consequence carried more weight for Benjamin Sisko because it was never just the lives of a crew that was at stake. These weren't just Starfleet officers who were duty bound to fight the good fight, or even civilians with which he carried no personal connection. This was his son and his only real connection to this world. Every single thing in Deep Space Nine mattered just that little bit more because Ben Sisko was the only captain in Star Trek history who stood to lose something he truly loved. So there you have it, those are 10 reasons Benjamin Sisko is Star Trek's greatest ever captain. There is no need to try and tell me it's Kirk in the comments, nobody wants to see your ass. Let me know what you made of it all in the comments below, and of course don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. In the meantime though, I have of course been Adam Cleary, a man who only has one thing in common with Ben Sisko, and that's a banging gumbo, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.